I, let me let me quickly introduce Wolfgang. We go way back to his student times when he is still in, when he was still at Technical University Dresden, where we worked a lot on GPU programming back then. And uh, Wolfgang did his diploma here in uh, in in Dresden, near in Dresden, and then uh, went to Nvidia, going to industry and working with them. And uh, then he decided to go back at one point to, um, uh, to actually being a scientist and did his master in computer science again at UCLA. So he does have a diploma and a master and then uh, with, uh, stayed at UCLA and also did his PhD. And in both uh, of these uh, uh, um, parts of his of his work, uh, it was already on autonomous systems and drones. And at the same time, or in parallel, he started um, having a career with uh, Amazon Robotics and later on also with Bitcraze in, in Sweden. And now uh, Wolfgang is, has gone almost full circle. Uh, now he's now located in in Berlin, and he is now an independent uh, junior group leader, uh, financed by the Eminöta program. So he can decide where to go with his his junior group, and he's going to tell us a bit on what he's doing right now. And I'm very happy we have seen each other last time ten years ago, something like this. I'm very happy to see you again. Welcome. All right. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be uh, back. And you can also and, sit down. You no, I, I actually prefer okay, perfect. standing up. Uh, and yeah, I have fond memories of Misha, who actually led me into uh, research. So it's great to still doing research and maybe doing it together again in the future. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the past and the future, in particular, my work on motion coordination for multi-rotor teams. And so my work is mostly motivated by a very far-reaching applications in search and rescue, industry 4.0, and collaborative construction, where the idea is that you have autonomous vehicles, such as drones or other kinds of robots, that help you uh, work on these applications where you have many robots working together, potentially in fairly small environments. And one can imagine that for such applications, maybe the most fundamental building block is just moving from A to B, a bunch of robots. And so it turns out that this is actually pretty difficult, even from a computer science perspective. So even if you consider the discrete time and space case where you just move in like a grid, like on the left-hand picture, uh, doing that optimally is actually known to be NP hot, even to a process. Now, if you move into continuous time and space, uh, that's even harder, uh, formally it's P-space hot. But if we have actual physical robots, then it's becoming more interesting because we also have to consider higher order derivatives uh, and also interactions. And what I mean by interactions, I will explain a little bit, but it's relevant for many applications, including drones and uh, manipulation. And to my knowledge, we don't really know the formal complexity uh, of that. So today I want to present kind of three different lines of work I have done in that area. Um, and I guess we are a few people here, so if you want, you can kind of keep it interactive and you can ask questions as we go. And if it takes too long, I would just I have areas that I can cut it through. Um, so let's dive into uh, maybe some older work, but still pretty important uh, in my opinion, um, which is how can we actually solve this motion planning problem in a centralized way very efficiently? And so here the idea is pretty simple. Uh, we have a known map uh, with start locations on the left, uh, the circle, and goal locations on the right. And uh, we have some robot model, of course. And our goal is to find some smooth trajectories and also a goal assignment that helps us to navigate such that we avoid obstacles with the fixed environment, but also with the other drugs. 
And so now here comes the part where interaction is actually really exciting. So if you have multiple robots, uh, then they can fly very easily in the horizontal, very close to each other. But if you fly on top of each other, you get aerodynamic effects. And those effects are pretty difficult to predict. And what people do typically is uh, having very large safety distances in the vertical. Um, and so the model that we proposed here is based on some older kind of wind tunnel style experiment that seem to indicate that if we use those axis aligned ellipsoids where the vertical length is much longer uh, than the horizontal length, uh, then that is a reasonable collision model to avoid this problem. And so the idea for motion planning now combines techniques from different domains. So first, we will talk about discrete planning uh, for multiple agents in that case. Uh, and then the output will be something that's kind of annoying to execute on real physical robots. And then the second step, we will talk about continuous post-processing. How do we actually make it smooth so we can execute it on real robots nicely? So let's start with a discrete uh, planning stage. Uh, so first, our input is some sort of environment description that we may be obtained through sensing or other methods. And in this little example, we just have two robots uh, with like a cylinder in the middle, and they have to swap places. Now, the first thing you have to do whenever you want to do something in a discrete world is you have to discretize the space. And so what we do here is we use a probabilistic method, which is called probabilistic roadmap or PRM, uh, which can generate a roadmap. However, PRM typically creates those graphs that are very, very dense, which is not good for planning. So instead we use an algorithm that's known as sparse, which basically uses graph theory to keep just important edges and vertices while also keeping approximation guarantees on the solution quality as that your graph I can give you. And an example is shown on the lower right hand corner. Now, once you have this graph, technically that would be sufficient to plan for a single agent on the roadmap. But if you have multiple agents, uh, there's an additional uh, challenge. And that challenge is that uh, you have to consider the interactions. So if you, for example, have one robot moving on this black edge over here and a second robot on as this vertex stationary here. And if there's an overlap between those ellipsoid collision shapes, then of course, uh, there is a potential conflict. So we uh, detect such vertex edge, vertex vertex, and edge edge conflicts, and use a quadratic program to kind of annotate the roadmap with all pairwise potential collisions. And that can be done really quickly. I will show you some numbers uh, later on. Now, once you do that, uh, you can uh, try to use a multi-agent pathfinding algorithm. Uh, unfortunately, the existing ones kind of don't work on those generalized roadmaps. So what we did is we extended as this uh, method to include those generalized conflicts um, and found also new solvers that can find solutions on the roadmap for multiple robots. So solutions are in principle valid to execute, but you see that there's many kind of uh, sharp terms. So for quad rotor, what it means is you can kind of follow the path, but at every vertex, you would basically need to stop. So your acceleration goes back to zero, and then you speed up again. So it's, of course, very inefficient from an energy point of view. So the big question now is how can we go from this kind of rough schedule on what to do to something that is much more nicely uh, executable on real robots? And so for that, we use an idea from optimization. And to explain it a little bit, uh, we have here three robots and four time steps. So that's like a 2D plane and an XY coordinate system. And the three robots are red, green, and blue. And so the first time step here is just highlighting. 
Now, if you're interested in separating the robots, we can try to find separating hyperplanes between the green and the red robot and the green and the blue robot. And we create, uh, therefore, some region, a polygon. Uh, in this case, that kind of gives us a safe corridor for the green robot for that particular time step. We can repeat the same procedure for the second time step, third time step, and fourth time step. And you see that every single time we get different polygons, and the polygons are actually overlapping in between. Now in 3D, it actually looks quite interesting because our polygons suddenly become polyhedral, and our discrete path for one robot is the black line, where one time step is just highlighted uh, in red. So, and the associated polyhedra is also highlighted in red. Now, our optimization has the goal of finding a smooth trajectory that goes within the safe corridor, roughly following the path, which is shown as this pipe like structure in the picture. Now, practically, how can we do it? We use a nice mathematical tool known as the Bezier curves or Bezier splines. And those Bezier splines have the property that the curve itself lies within the convex hull of its control points. So if we constrain the control points to be in some polygon, like in this picture, it is always guaranteed that the curve itself will also be within the polygon, like in the picture. And so that's basically what we do. We do a trajectory optimization where we minimize a notion of energy for our multi rotors uh, subject to the constraint for, for time steps that we stay within our polyhedra. And then it's a spline, so we enforce continuity between the different time steps. And it turns out that that is a quadratic program, which means we can solve it very efficiently in practice. And our decision variables are just the Bezier control points. And all of them are distributed per robot, which means we can run it in parallel. And so if we do that, uh, for this little running example, uh, what we get here, uh, we get this nice smooth uh, trajectories uh, where hopefully no robots collide. Now it also turns out that this is uh, pretty efficient. Uh, just to give you an example, we have here 32 robots. Generating the roadmap takes 50 seconds. Finding the conflict annotation, less than one second. Finding a discrete solution, less than one second. And doing the refinement, uh, less than 30 seconds. So in total, we have less than two minutes. And we also did another example with 200 robots just to show you scalability, and it's still less than uh, 10 minutes. So it is uh, scaling really, really well. And to put it in perspective, is that good or bad? I mean, it's sometimes hard to tell, but the previous state of the art was, uh, uh, so that was a publication in, uh, I think, 2017 or 2018. The previous was five years earlier, and they had no obstacles. Uh, they tried to do it for 16 uh, robots, couldn't do it, had to use symmetry to just plan for eight, and that took 20 minutes. So just to show you the boss big deal, uh, and it's a pretty good result. Now, of course, it would be only fun if it actually works, and it does. So here's an example of the 32 robots that are actually flying. Those robots are really, really tiny. Um, so they fit in the palm of my hand. And you can see that they get very close to obstacles, very close to each other, but they're not crashing. And so the second part of the video that you see uh, is a heterogeneous uh, extension. So a little bit later, we looked at how can we do the planning also for teams with different size drones and also ground robots. Um, so that works really well. Uh, and then we also looked at how to combine it uh, with machine learning. And I will talk about that uh, just in the next part. Um, so that's basically all I wanted to say about classic AI. So if anybody has questions, I can take it now and then we go into more. I, I, I would have an imminent question. Yeah. 
Um, so right now you're you're still working with this uh, hard sphere model, which is quite quite nice, uh -huh. and I think is is fair enough. Uh, one thing with the with the Bezier approach that was uh, for me fascinating is um, the optimization is basically done per drone, and only the collision part is is basically pre-computed. So you have a, an almost uh, uh, embarrassingly parallel pro uh, problem here, which is, which is really nice. However, if you would like to have global optimization of all drones for that might be usable for some, some given uh, application, uh, that approach would probably fail because you only have local optimization with the Bezier curves within one of these uh, cubes or uh, and and you have actually minimized uh, interaction in in some sense so am i am i already asking questions to the next part of the talk or <laughs> a little bit but it's, okay. a, it's a very exciting topic for me so it's true that the uh, optimization is distributed however the discrete funnel is actually centralized it's and centralized. it also is um bounded suboptimum. So that means as a user, you can say, I want an optimal solution within the bound of, let's say, 1.5. Mm -hmm. And the planner will give you that, okay. guaranteed. However, the downside is it only works on the roadmap. So if you did a bad job generating a roadmap, um, then maybe you miss the true optimal solutions that only exist in the continuous space. So in this world, we cannot guarantee the kind of end-to-end found it some optimality, mm -hmm. but it's something I'm currently working on to okay. get closer to, uh, to that. And I will also talk a little bit towards the end of the talk. I was, I was, I was sending emails to Michael Hecht, one of our uh, junior group leaders, and I hope he has joined by now. Otherwise, he's, he's on the premise, but I'm not sure if he's in. You might want to talk to him. That's the thing. Excellent. <laughs> Justin has raised his hand. Justin. Yes. <clears throat> um, Hi there. Hi. Nice talk so far, enjoying it. Um, I, I'm wondering uh, if you or anyone else in the literature are, are, are in that field are considering um, sort of animal uh, collective motion analogies. So there's a, there's a large field of research called collective animal motion that looks at uh, the navigational mechanisms that allow uh, flocks of birds and schools of fish to move very quickly in very close proximity to each other and execute all kinds of uh, turns and changes in uh, polarization of the group and, and things like that. Uh, it seems like there would be lots of interesting um, uh, insights that could be gained by trying to bring that uh, perspective into some of the work that, that you're doing. Is anybody looking at things like that? Yes, excellent question. So there's, of course, many people who look at the more bio-inspired perspective. And the way I view it is that it's kind of a top-down versus a bottom-up approach. So if you, for the bio-inspired idea, you take kind of the top-down approach. You see uh, how solutions work, maybe in nature or by running simulations. And then I see what maybe should the individual control law, so to speak, what should it be for each robot to create the same behavior? Now, and that's typically known as swarm robotics, and there's like a lot of researchers working on this. Uh, what I mostly work on is more the bottom uh, up approach, where the idea is that you mostly take ideas from a single robot research and try to scale it up so that it still works for multi robot systems. And I think both of the research directions are. Uh, important and ideally at some point we meet in the middle. Uh, right now we're kind of two different groups, uh, I would say, um, unfortunately. Um, but occasionally we have, you know, workshops and conferences and also talk to each other. I, I just have a comment because Justin didn't make that comment. He's one of the experts on animal movement. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> That's so we funny. should talk. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I would uh, have a question towards this direction. <clears throat> I'm wondering, so you mentioned before in your talk the aerodynamic aspect, and uh, thus far you just consider the sphere as a rigid sphere, essentially, whereas uh, following the sort of moving patterns, like, I don't know, migrating birds, or be it a cyclist and a peloton, 
it is uh, advantageous to form a group in motion in 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 aerodynamic sense as well. I don't know if you're going to talk about that at all, but yes, I'm going to talk. Okay, about that. Then I'm not going to get <laughs> ahead of myself. By now, and get all our answer <laughs> notes. <laughs> One more. Uh... Question or, or follow up? Uh, to those Pia questions. is first. You had okay. your first one, you have to wait. All right. No, Justin can go ahead. <laughs> no, no, please, Pia. But, but uh, first things first, can you maybe turn up the volume a little bit? Just okay. it's very quiet. Um, so the, um, the, the trajectory planning is done centralized. Yeah, that's right, yes. Yes. How do the drones receive the signal where to move or how to move? Uh, for this video, we just uh, mapped the environment beforehand. Uh, then we planned everything on a desktop computer. And then we uh, got final trajectories and we just uploaded them to the drone. Okay. And then it's actually flown in a motion capture space. Uh, so the drones get uh, also centralized information about their position, similar to GPS. Okay. Okay. So no online trajectory planning yet. Not yet. In this, in this project, at least. <laughs> Not in this part of the talk. Ah, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, Justin. Now you're, it's your turn again. You're sorry it's my turn again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was no. <laughs> I'm oh, not sure yes. how to take that, but okay. Thank you. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> So just thinking about this idea of uh, uh, meeting in the middle between the, uh, the top down and, and bottom up perspectives. And again, um, with respect to the uh, collective motion analogy, oftentimes in, in collective motion situations, you have a sort of leader follower dynamic where there's one or a small number of leaders and everybody else is just following and trying not to run into each other. And that would seem to me to be like, a, to, to, you know, kind of be the way that you'd want to think about finding that middle ground, like how many leaders do you have and how many followers, that kind of thing. Is there synthetic work that's going in that direction? Trying to, trying to, you know, where the, the, the leaders are basically the bottom up problem and the followers are the top down side of the problem, something like that. Yeah, so, so also in the multi-robot community is as people work on basically formation flight uh, in that sense. And frequently, when you do formation flight, you also have one or more artificial leaders and others are basically following using, you know, laws similar to Boyd's law, but maybe more driven by control theory so that you can still uh, prove certain guarantees such as safety. Um, so that exists. Uh, it's slightly different from the work I presented here, where in principle, it would be possible that all the robots move in completely opposite directions. So to give you one example, uh, I worked at Amazon Robotics and some of the work is applicable there. And there the robots basically just move shelves around and they don't just move in a group and all move in the same direction, but they often move in completely opposite directions. And the difficulty in coordination becomes more about avoiding kind of each other in narrow hallways and making sure that you don't block other robots while you're operating. Okay. Justin, you're not here today, are you? No. No, I'm not. Okay. Be there tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I just have one question about the robot. Um, is there any perception system inside? Because I noticed for the swarm for the small robots, they're actually on a camera inside, right? So the robot itself does not have any perception besides an IMU, okay. but there's, it's extendable um, and there's an extension board mm -hmm. that has a camera that is 330 times 330 pixels mm -hmm. and has a RISC-5 8-core companion mm -hmm. processor to run machine learning models mm -hmm. from inference. Okay, so the, for the 3D trajectories planning, um, the map is actually already designed or already mapped. So yes, there's no structure from motion such as technologies. No, okay. only in pre-processing. Because the way we mapped it was actually using a Kinect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't think so. Okay. Let's <laughs> dive into maybe machine learning. Everybody is not as hot about that. 
<laughs> not sure. Not us. <laughs> uh, maybe it could change. Um, okay, so one thing that's interesting because we, we kind of talked about the centralized and decentralized already is that centralized planners produce really beautiful uh, trajectories and plans that are typically complete, often optimal or bounded uh, suboptimal. Um, but they're kind of impractical because they require you to already know everything up front, but typically you do not know everything up front. Okay? And just to give you an example, you have the video again. As a decentralized plan, I've also kind of work, but often robots just get lost behind. And this particular example, uh, we have uh, we have like some robots that got stuck here in, in some sort of a life lock. Uh, situation. So the question is, can we kind of combine those two worlds in an intelligent way? And so the idea is pretty simple. We first take our centralized planner uh, that I just demonstrated to you, uh, generate a lot of cool examples, maybe for a week or so. Uh, then we extract out of those central plans just local observations so we can have a different sort of uh, observation radar, for example, or encode whatever we want to encode, no matter what we want. And then we just train it using imitation learning. Uh, and then hopefully the result is good enough and works. Right? So that idea is pretty simple, has been around for at least 10 years, and uh, sounds cool, but has many downsides. And then today I want to talk about how to do it and avoid those downsides. Um, but first, to just put it visually, uh, the way it works, we just generate a lot of those examples, which you see uh, some cases here. And then we extract those kind of local observations, which means we just kind of sample at the resulting trajectories uh, to the points in time and encode our, our local observation. Uh, and then the question is, how can we do it such that it's safe? Because typically when we have uh, machine learning models and we get some policy out, we put it on our robots and then we kind of have to hope that it works. And we will never really know if it will work or not, right? Like there might be some new data point that we haven't really trained on uh, and it just doesn't work. And so here's some simple yet novel idea where we just do a complex combination of the learned policy uh, beta in this example, uh, and a barrier. And a barrier is known from control theory. It's just a method that can do collision avoidance, but it's prone to life and deadlocks. So it definitely avoids collisions, but you might kind of get stuck. In the and uh, the convex combination uh, the idea is just, well, if you're in a region where you're pretty safe, then you would more or less only want to form your own policy. So your alpha should be close to one. Uh, but if you're in a region that's kind of dangerous, then you more or less just want to follow the barrier because that gives you the safety. Uh, so your alpha should be uh, close uh, to zero. And so just to give you an example of how this looks like for very simple functions, uh, it's pretty trivial. The safety set is really just the uh, sum of relative vectors normalized by some safety distance. Uh, and that's some KP is just some kind of tunable gain uh, to make it behave nice. And so that's actually known as a safety set theory. Well, the cool thing is that uh, this is actually fully differentiable. So if you do your training, you can put at the last layer uh, this exact equation that I just showed you, everything is differentiable. So it means when you then run your stochastic gradient descent or whatever you use to do training, uh, you can actually propagate, back propagate through your safety module. You can still do end to end training, um, which is great. And I will talk about the actual network architecture a little bit later. It's not that important right now. So let's just focus on the safety first. And so in this example, we just uh, kind of did that. And we actually compared to a baseline, which is known as Orca, which is one of the things that might be more coming from the 
animal inspired world. So it's a very simple uh, kind of control law uh, that helps you avoid collisions. And we can see that even this fairly limited amounts of data we really quickly outperform uh, our baseline. And we even can do that with fairly limited sensor radar, right? Like we only need to see about two meters uh, about your surroundings to already get pretty decent results. Um, we can actually also deploy that to the same robots and it might look boring, but it actually runs all on board. And to just tell you a little bit how challenging that is, look at the specs of our microcontroller. We have 168 megahertz and uh, 192 kilobytes of RAM. And we just run inference on that thing without a lot of coding tricks actually at 40 hertz uh, to evaluate in real time. And the other cool thing is that this seemingly simple method actually automatically transforms our centralized policy to a distributed policy, which so far in, in like the theory, in the theory community is not even known how you would do it maybe manually or is it if it's even possible for certain cases if I give you a centralized policy and I want to know can I convert that to a distributed policy we don't really know right but it's a big open problem and so the data driven method here uh, can help us do that and we also made it safe by just this fairly little trick of combining control theory uh, with machine learning in like the last day Okay, so now let's do something a little bit more, I would say, <laughs> spooky. Um, so let's say we don't just have a team of robots that all work together, but we have two teams of robots. And let's think about something nice like uh, robot soccer. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have a goal for each team, what they have to achieve. And so in, in this running example, what I'm just showing is known as a reach, target, avoid game. Uh, so play the video game. Uh, we have uh, kind of the red robots that try to protect a certain area, and then we have the blue robots that try to go to that uh, green goal region. Why is this not called Kidditch? <laughs> <laughs> it was a missed opportunity. Sorry. <laughs> And so before I explain maybe how what might be a copyright violation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Before I explain how we kind of tackle this case, I want to give some brief background. Uh, maybe you know it already, but so we rely on a technique called Monte Carlo research, uh, which is well known in, I guess, physics and computer science. And it has a bunch of steps. So, first, uh, we do a simulation step. So, we started our start state, we pick some action that we want to explore. Uh, then we uh, transition to the next uh, state uh, that gives us some maybe estimate of the reward uh, by running even longer uh, simulations, and that gives us an estimated value of the leaper. And then based on that, we just propagate it up, and the next time we just repeat. And that means that every single node, we will know how good of a node it is. And then we can we have nice mathematical tools for trade-off between exploration and exploitation which is always a problem uh, in search. Now, how does my type robot work? Pretty simple. Uh, you just view it as a game where you have multiple actions to pick. So first to pick for the first robots and you pick for the second robot, third robot and so on. And then you get a new state after you picked all actions that is just a joint state of all the robots. And so what you might also know is uh, alpha zero that was, was like big in the news a couple of years ago for beating the world champion in Go. And they basically used a method that is combined Monte Carlo tree search with machine learning. And they just trained two networks. The first one is a kind of policy network that picks the action. And the second one is the value network that predicts how good a certain node uh, might be. And so the idea here is more or less the same. Um, so what we do in this work is that we first have a decentralized learner that has very limited uh, computation 
and that can generate some samples of interest. And that is, by the way, just a quantum current research at the end. And now we have an expert, which is centralized, also a Monte Carlo research, that we give much more computation and that uses those uh, kind of initial states of interest that the learner produced to give us more high quality demonstrations of what we should have done in this case. And then uh, once we have all this nice data, we can again train some neural networks and we can repeat and we use those two networks similar to uh, alpha zero uh, to kind of speed up our Monte Carlo tree search to make it much more efficient. So far so easy. Now one big problem with uh, alpha uh, this uh, baseline is that it kind of works like in Go and uh, discrete spaces. So you have discrete states, discrete actions. But in robots, we have continuous states and continuous actions. And so what we did is that we extended this method to handle this particular case. Uh, and we do that by learning a probability distribution for the actions. Uh, we use just a Gaussian, but you could use any kind of autoencoder if you wanted to. Uh, it just is much more data hungry. Uh, and then everything else is more or less uh, like alpha zero. There's some tricks, but I won't get into it here. And so the way it looks like is again very simple. We have this expert, which is now this Monte Carlo tree search as uh, shown on the left. So it's all uh, kind of in one joint uh, state space uh, where we have some input and compute a good output. And then we have the learner where we now, instead of having one Monte Carlo tree search, we have uh, for each robot, so five uh, Monte Carlo tree searches uh, that run in a distributed way and only consider uh, the other robots that are within, again, our sensing radius. And in both cases, we use neural networks to speed up the search to make it more feasible. And then we applied it to that game that I presented at the beginning, and we compared it to a baseline that uh, is based on control theory and is uh, almost optimal, but not quite. Like they use a kind of greedy assignment followed by an optimal solution, but because the assignment is greedy, the overall solution is not optimal. And so maybe because of that, it's not surprising that we managed to outperform it uh, pretty quickly for both teams. And we also applied it uh, on real robots. Now this time it doesn't really run on board, unfortunately. So here we run it in a distributed fashion on a desktop computer, which just runs the Monte Carlo tree search, one process for each drone, uh, and then sends the resulting commands. Um, but it's like a normal computer can do it for the whole team of five robots in real time. Uh, and then we did sort of fun little demos for our process. Now what's cool here is that it's pretty fast. So just on a desktop, you get those results for pretty difficult uh, game theoretic problems. Um, it's also safe again, and here's a trick is the Monte Carlo tree search, because we actually don't let our neural network decide what to do. We let the Monte Carlo tree search decide what to do, and the neural network just acts as a heuristic uh, where to search. And it actually also turns out that the method itself is pretty generic, and uh, we applied it to many different uh, scenarios, uh, including kind of motion planning and different kinds of dynamics and so on. Okay, so far so good. Any questions about that? The next topic will be uh, deeper into a little bit deeper into the learning aspect. I'm I'm very much looking forward to this, and I'm not sure I want to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually have one question for the multi agent robot systems. Um, as mentioned, we're using actually Monte Carlo research, a uh, tree search. And how can I, how can we guarantee the divergence from this? Because are you using something like the game theories, the Lash or Stackenberg, such kind of theories to guarantee the divergence from this alpha zero or this kind of like algorithms? 
Not sure what you mean by divergence. You mean that it converges to yeah, um, some optimum? Yes, convergence. Oh, it converges to an optimum. So for Monte Carlo tree search, it has been shown that it will converge to the optimum. Mm -hmm. But the convergence rate is up in the air because the search space is so high. So if you would run it forever, it would eventually converge to the optimal result. Now, of course, we just ended early. And yeah. how close you are when you end it early to the optimal result, that's an open problem. OK. OK, that's all. Uh, I will wait until the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... You said that um, because of the uh, using the Monte Carlo tree search, uh, the method becomes more safe since it's not dependent on a neural net. Um, but why exactly Monte Carlo tree search? Uh, I, I mean, it's everything you said is like reinforcement learning methods, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there are also other reinforcement learning methods which don't, which don't necessarily need to, to uh, rely on neural nets in the end, or can be, uh, th there can be additions done with neural nets. Why Monte Carlo tree search? So you mean something like QLearn? Yeah. Um, so still this QLearning, let's say it takes a, Simple case of Q learning that's like a tabular lookup, right? Then uh, you still have the same problems that you get in this case a deterministic uh, policy. So for every single state that you might be in, it tells you what action to do. Now, if you do want to call a pre search, you can also take into account your current observation. So let's say, for example, uh, there's a new obstacle. Uh, that appeared that you haven't seen before. And you can kind of cut this portion of the branch off and pick a different action than what your Q value, for example, uh, your, your Q table would have proposed. Ah, okay. So it's not as prone to unseen data? As I would say so. And it's much less prone to okay. the other problems that learning might bring. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I'm so interested in going on and I still have to keep my questions to the end. So. <laughs> uh, maybe the last one is most intense. So yeah. interesting. <laughs> anyway, we have some time afterwards. <laughs> okay, so I talked at the beginning about safety distances between robots, right? And I showed you that if you fly on top of each other, it's somewhat dangerous. And I hope every one of you is excited to see what actually happens. And well, here's how it looks like. Um, I'm sorry, it's very anticlimactic. <laughs> Everybody was hoping for a crash. And if you would reduce the distance, you would get your crash. Uh, but in this case, we picked like a safe enough distance. And you just see this downward dip. And so we tried to quantify this and say, you know, how bad is it? And oh man, it's pretty bad. So here we have our uh, quad rotors again. And just for scale, they're about nine centimeters rotor to rotor. So we put some half a meter away, so it's like five times the body size. And in this case, we already lose about nine grams of the lower quad rotor. And to put that to scale, so it is almost one third of the total mass of the quad rotor. So it is pretty significant, like uh, quite scary actually. And that's even for the homogeneous case, the video I just showed you was a heterogeneous case where we had different kinds of robots. Um, and so it actually turns out nobody really looked at it. So there were some people who looked at single rotors, what happens, there were some people who looked at one quad rotor putting in the wind tunnel and see what happens, but not really multiple. Um, multi rotors are not really heterogeneous teams of different kind of size controls. Um, and of course, the idea here is again, the core idea is very simple. Well, we just generate a lot of data and then we use some sort of machine learning to approximate it. Right? And then again, I will try to show you how to do it actually in a small way to get guarantees. Okay, so let's dive a little bit into robot dynamics. Actually, a quad rotor is super simple. It's just a rigid body uh, in 3D space where you can act some forces on, where your rotors are. 
And I will hide that and will just tell you that we have uh, some sort of function that gives our uh, x dot the change of our state is some function of our current state and our control. Now, the state for quadrotor is just uh, position, velocity, uh, orientation, angular velocity. And our control is really just the rotational speed, or you can see it as a force as at each of the rotors generally. Now, what happens if you put another robot nearby, then there's some additional term, which we call residual dynamics, that we haven't accounted for. So in particular, we are mostly interested in this residual force, or FA, in the equation. Um, there can be also interest in the residual torque, or tau A. However, in our experiments, it has been shown to kind of be very minor, so it's okay to not look at it, uh, at least for the talk. And so what's really tricky here now is that this residual force is some sort of function, but the function depends on the neighboring robot. So for the small robot here, we probably maybe depend on this guy and this guy, but maybe not on the guy all the way over here, right? Because that one is just far away. But it might depend on another robot of a different type, like the large robot. So in general, it's a function that gets us input some sort of multi-set or multiple sets. Um, it's also challenging because they're all flying around, so they're kind of moving. They have velocity in our state space. Uh, and of course, at the end, we want to run it all on board. So we need to find a way to do it fast. And so before I dive into how to do it, let's uh, do another background uh, on so-called deep sets. Uh, they are somewhat old, like about four years old, but not that well known yet. And the idea is as follows. Uh, let's assume we have some permutation invariant function that gets us input at x, and you want to approximate it. Um, so then the key idea here is that we just have to learn two functions. So the first function, the inner function, learns some representation of each element in either a higher or a lower dimensional state space. Then the superposition, all of those uh, elements in this hidden state are using a simple sum, and then we aggregate the result of the hidden state to our output. So pretty simple, to give you an example, uh, if our set is a picture, uh, pretty low resolution, so now our nice inner function could just transform the picture to the actual number representation. Uh, then the superposition would actually add them. And then our outer function would be just the identity function that returns our uh, result. Now, what's cool about deep sets is that uh, they actually are quite some improvement over traditional methods that people use, which are typically conv convolutional neural networks. And those networks uh, require that you somehow discretize your state space. So you could, for example, generate like a 3D voxel map and then say, oh, in this voxel, there's a neighboring robot. But then it becomes really, really large and very inefficient for inference, not only to talk about training. Um, so we can now operate with pretty small networks in continuous space, which is great. What's not so great is that it only works for the simple permutation invariant functions, but we have heterogeneous permutation invariant functions. And so, in particular, uh, we have uh, this one robot, like the last one over here, then it has maybe uh, two neighbors like, of the same type, like two small green ones, and uh, the yellow environment, and another one. And we have to somehow account for that. So we extended those heterogeneous as those deep sets to the heterogeneous case. And the structure is pretty simple. So we now have uh, more functions that we need to learn. So we have the inner function for each robot type, and we have the outer function for each robot type. And the deep set would really just look like that. We apply uh, the inner function for the small robot for the relative state between three and one, the inner function for the small robot for the relative state between three and two, uh, the inner function for the environment between three and four, and then we sum it all up 
and then we apply it to the aggregation function of the type we are looking at, the large type. Uh, or in equations, it pretty much looks like before, except that we now have an additional sum over the different types that we want to consider. And so in the paper, we have some nice proofs. Uh, so first of all, it's actually expressive. So we can approximate any k-group permutation invariant function using this kind of structure, um, which is good. And it's also efficient, which means uh, we actually only need to train a linear number of uh, networks, uh, not like quadratic or something in the number of types, which you know is also good in terms of data efficiency. Okay, so how does it now work? Data collection is pretty simple. We need labeled data. Um, and what we do is we just fly randomly. We use the most simple method for collision avoidance we could find. And then we collect uh, just the onboard data, which is the accelerometer, the orientation from our extended Kalman filter state estimator, uh, and also the motor forces that we uh, set the controller basically tells us. And then we just use uh, the simple dynamics equation to compute our residual force Fa over here. And so we end up with a data set that has a, a set of relative states and the robot types uh, on one side, and then as label, uh, it has our Fa. Now, that's kind of how it looks like. Um, not that interesting. I think in total we have maybe one hour or so of flight data, so it's not a lot, but you can imagine if you fly three, you get a lot of kind of pairs, so it's, it's kind of nice. And then, of course, once you can compute that bay, um, which by the way only takes again a few milliseconds on the same microcontroller, then we can just add it as a feed forward term in our position controller and hopefully compensate uh, for the force uh, while you apply. Now that's again scary to me because oh there's a neural network now in our controller, which means that sounds unsafe. Um, and so what we do here in order to guarantee stability is uh, that we use something known as uh, spectral normalization, uh, which is also a relatively recent technique. And what it can do for you is that it basically enforces that your resulting trained neural network has a bounded Lipschitz constant, which means it is bounded how much it can change. And then traditional control theory typically deals with disturbance as some sort of bounded change. So all we had to do is plug in the neural network as a bounded disturbance. We guarantee that the disturbance is bounded by using spectral normalization. And then we can kind of follow up with the traditional proofs for stability. And we can actually show in this case under all the traditional assumptions uh, that is still exponentially stable. So we're good and safe. Um, okay. And so here's how it looks like. Uh, you can see there's no more dip. There's like a little kind of shock in the attitude, uh, but it's definitely uh, looking quite nice. Uh, skip that. Um, quantitatively, uh, it also looks pretty good. I just want to maybe point out one example here. So here we have the large on top of the small in our baseline. Uh, we get a maximum error in the C distance of nearly 20 centimeters. Uh, now with our neural network, we cut that uh, by over half. And this is like the same across the board um, that we get uh, really good results uh, in terms of uh, error reduction. And by the way, our baseline here is not a baseline. It's actually a really, really strong baseline. It's like a state-of-the-art nonlinear controller that uses exactly the same games and that we're tuned for those particular scenarios as a neural network. Um, okay, and then what you can do is cool demos for YouTube. Um, and sponsors. So here we have uh, 16 robots, two different kinds, and they kind of move very close. We tried to do the same thing with like the traditional controller and it would simply crash. And quantitatively, the minimum Z distance here is instead of 60 centimeters, now 24 centimeters. 
So it's significantly uh, reduced, and we're mostly just limited by uh, the thrust to weight ratio that our quad rotors have. Like if we would fly closer, we would need to put much better motors on it to actually actively compensate uh, for the downward. Now, of course, we also want to know how it looks like because we like pretty plots. Uh, and it's the first empirical model. Um, and so here's uh, some example of uh, what our model can predict. So if we have uh, a robot that is here where the uh, green cursor is, and this robot has like a big uh, drone and two small drones on top, then it gets an additional downwash of uh, color coded here of nearly 20 uh, grams. And so we can kind of look at those different plots and try to understand also maybe what is the physics behind it, because we still don't know how we would even model it from a, a physics perspective. Now to go back to Misha's question, um, it would be cool if we would do optimal motion planning with like an accurate model. And so what we have done is to show that it's beneficial uh, by uh, developing a new motion planner that combines strength of sampling-based motion planning and optimization-based motion planning. Um, it shows that we can achieve more tracking error and no disturbance violation if we do the planning, but it has a downside that it's extremely slow. Uh, so I think even this like simple 2D example took maybe half an hour or so to compute. Um, which brings me to conclusion and outlook. So I think I just want to tell you two things, so I hope you get two things out of it. First of all, motion coordination is like maybe the most crucial thing we have to do, and we still don't really know how to do it. Uh, and it's really difficult because we have this continuous time and space spaces. Uh, we have our dynamics of the robots, and we have interaction that are in particular difficult for my robot. And we can solve right now already very challenging instances of those sort of problems by providing still formal guarantees by just basically combining ideas from different fields. And what I've shown you today is a combination of what's often known as classic AI, um, like so search based planning, optimization, machine learning, and also control theory. Now, so it also means if you think back to kind of this motivating examples that I brought you at the beginning, this like search and rescue, industry 4.0, collaborative construction, you're pretty much really far away from it, right? Like you're still just at the motion planning stage. And so in general, I think what lies ahead is how can we actually plan in high dimensional spaces under uncertainty with theoretical guarantees efficiently? And that's kind of the major scope of my research group at TU Berlin, uh, which is uh, the Intelligent Multi-Robot Coordination Lab. And with that, I would also acknowledge the many, many people uh, in all the work I presented today happen, uh, my alma maters, and then of course, uh, DFG as uh, my current funding uh, agency. Thanks. Thank you.